thank you everybody for joining us uh, for a, another installment of Northern Virginia Family Practices Town Hall Series. Um, we're going to get started in just a moment, but I uh, just wanted to let everybody know, uh, you probably heard that we are moving. Uh, we sent emails out to everybody. We're moving again, unfortunately, to Army Navy Drive in the Sherlington area. Um, it's not too far. It's a great space, and this should be our uh, final resting place for many, many, many years after this. So, um, so hopefully we won't have any more moves after this. Um, and uh, it's probably going to happen sometime in early September, but uh, as we get more information about that, we'll certainly let you know and send out uh, information about that. Um, but uh, that's the only announcement for today. And so now on to our main event. Um, we have a very special town hall tonight. Sounds like a Hallmark movie, um, but we're going to be talking about advances in HIV. And while we don't see a, a, a huge amount of HIV in our clinic, particularly, uh, it's a really important topic to us because uh, Washington, D.C. and the Baltimore area are consistently in the top five highest rates of HIV in the country. And as I just found out, uh, DC may be even among the highest rates of HIV in the world. So while it may not affect you particularly, it certainly probably affects people that you know and people around you. So this is an important topic. And our presenter tonight is Dr. Adam Zweig from uh, all the way from California. If his name sounds familiar, that's because it is. He is my brother. Uh, and uh, if you're wondering, no, this is not nepotism. He's not getting paid for this. Uh, but he will earn the attention of our parents who are on the call with us tonight. So hopefully that's worth it to learn. Um, and Dr. Zweig grew up in uh, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He went to college at uh, Harvard University. Uh, which uh, left his uh, other siblings uh, to follow in big, have big shoes to fill. Um, and then he attended uh, University of uh, California, San Diego for medical school and completed his residency in internal medicine at Good Samaritan Hospital in Phoenix. Um, and then he returned back to San Diego to practice general internal medicine for a while and uh, later completed a specialty uh, in HIV medicine. And Dr. Zweig is currently the regional medical director at the AIDS Healthcare Foundation in San Diego. And he's also on the board of Mama's Kitchen, a local hot meal delivery program for people with HIV. So uh, with that said, I will let uh, Dr. Zweig take it away. Oh, thank you, Ken. I didn't expect that formal introduction. That's so nice. You must have my new CV, right? I do, yes. Did I know all that? about you. I remember a part of it is, is, is up here. I didn't okay. mention anything about the um, uh, about the David Letterman appearance. Oh yeah, you didn't mention anything about that. We can talk about it later if you want. I don't know. Um, anyway, thank you so much, Ken. Yes, I am Ken's brother, and uh, it's really nice uh, to be here to talk a little bit with all of you. I hope that the people on this talk are, you know, I imagine you just want a general view of the current state of affairs with HIV. It's really not going to be anything. Um, ground, uh, earth, earth shattering, groundbreaking, et cetera. Just sort of a, uh, an idea about how we manage HIV uh, currently. And this is a slide deck that was very nicely given to me by a Vive Medical Science Liaison. Vive is a, um, is a company that makes HIV therapeutics. They're owned by GSK. And uh, once again, this is a slide deck that's really made more for practitioners. So we're gonna go, we're gonna skip over some stuff um, that I think may not necessarily be uh, something that you, uh, that might be appropriate for this talk. I wanna tell you a little bit, before I start, start I wanna uh, speak a little bit about my organization. So I work for a nonprofit called AIDS Healthcare Foundation. I'm the medical director of the office in San Diego. And uh, we started as an AIDS hospice in Los Angeles <clears throat> many years ago. And fortunately, uh, after a while, the hospice wasn't required. And so that turned, uh, was converted into a, uh, a healthcare uh, center. And then the organization basically uh, spread from there. And we have now um, expanded into 52 sites in the United States. We have two offices in DC and one in Baltimore. Um, and we basically manage HIV care and HIV prevention. But we have all other lines of business as well. For instance, each one of our offices has a co-located pharmacy. 
and we make profits off of those uh, medications that we dispense. And the medications that we dispense are obviously expensive, high value medicines. And the profit that we make, we put back into our operation. We have a global line of business as well. We have 700 offices in the developing uh, world, including Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, and um, Eastern Europe. We also have an advocacy arm uh, at Public Health Division, and we have a healthy housing division as well, whereby we uh, purchase old hotels in the LA area and in Southern Florida, we convert them into low-income housing. So that's what we do, basically. Um, I don't think we have the voice uh, on right, Ken. So people cannot respond only by chat. Is that only correct? By chat. Yes. That's right. Okay. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and start. So I, we're going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology. Everybody can see this and everybody can hear me, right? Yeah. It's a nice okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of HIV. I'm going to skip global. We'll talk uh, basically about US epidemiology, we'll talk about transmission. You know most about this impact on health, the life cycle of uh, HIV, which I really like. We'll talk a little bit about medicines that we use currently. We're going to skip over drug resistance, so probably a little bit complex for what we need to talk about today. And then we'll talk about something that you're probably interested in, uh, PrEP, treatment as prevention, and undetectable equal life transmission. Okay? So let's start a skip over global epidemiology, and we're going to go into HIV epidemiology in the United States. So this is data from uh, the CDC uh, from 2020. And the average rate of prevalence of HIV, meaning people living with HIV in the United States is almost 400 per 100,000. The total number of people living with HIV in the United States is about 1.1 million. And you can see color coded the rates uh, in each state here. And as you might expect, larger states, more populous states have higher rates of HIV infection including California, Texas, and New York. But there's also some states here that you may not necessarily um, immediately think of, like Louisiana, Georgia, and Florida. And then if you look at the rate in DC, 2,260.5, which is about six times the average rate, um, uh, prevalence rate in the United States. And Maryland's up there as well, okay? Now, if we look at um, incidents, and so incidence means new infections over the past year. Uh, once again, we see the previous, previously mentioned populous states like California and New York, but we also see lots of black in the South. So the Southern states are where all the action is right now. So more than 50% of new infections in the United States in 2020 uh, occurred in the South. And there's various reasons for that, including uh, barriers to care, um, lack of interest, lack of funding for HIV prevention programs, et cetera. And this is where we focus a lot of our efforts to try to prevent HIV because the, the rates of uh, new infections are so high. Once again, you can see DC is really high at 32, uh, three times uh, the national rate of new infections. If we look at total new infections, um, this is once again CDC data. It was about 37,000 in 2019. It's kind of disappointing because it's only diminished slightly over the past three or four years. And this is at a time where we actually had medication to prevent HIV, it's called Truvada, and we've had it available for seven years. And despite that, we only see very much small reductions in the rate of new HIV infections. But then if you look at 2020, Lo and behold, you see an almost 20% drop in new HIV infections. <clears throat> and at first glance, you might think, wow, this is really something. Our HIV prevention efforts are really working. And that's not true. This is mostly artifactual because this was at the height of the pandemic. And many, if not most, testing agencies were closed at that time. So once again, this reduction is probably artifactual and not new. We look at how, what, what people are. Uh, being diagnosed with HIV, you can see mostly men, 80%, but 20% of women, that's not um, an insignificant number. So in the United States, one out of five new infections with HIV uh, occur in women, through, mostly through heterosexual transmission. Uh, most people who are infected are men who have sex with men, or MSM is, what we, is the term we use. But once again, almost one in four are through heterosexual contact. 
Uh, and then if we look at age groups that uh, are affected by HIV in terms of new infections, we consider somebody 34 or below to be young, which I do, we can see that young people have, have 57% of the new infections in 2020. So once again, we, this is where we want to focus our prevention efforts. We don't necessarily want to uh, put that much time and effort into people who are 55 and older, actually. So that means you and I would be considered old, Ken. But I we mean, don't want to, uh, yeah. I mean, yet. Not yet? Not yet, yeah. Oh yeah, you have a couple of years to go, sorry. Forgot about that. My, 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 uh, uh, I'm sorry, my error. But and so once again, so this is, these new infections are occurring in young people, right? And let, between 13 and 34. Uh, and then if we break down the differences of rates of new infection by race and ethnicity, once again, uh, racial disparities of care are alive and kicking in terms of HIV infection. So 69% of new infections in the United States, greater than two thirds of new infections occur in people of color. So people of Hispanic and Latino descent or blacks or African Americans, okay? And the reasons for this are once again, what you can imagine barriers to care, um, discrimination, uh, financial issues, et cetera. All right, so let's go over HIV transmission and I'm sure everybody knows this, but you can't acquire HIV through casual contact. Almost all uh, cases of HIV transmission occur because of sexual transmission or injection drug use. The other one that to think about is breast milk and the CDC currently recommends that women who are HIV positive not breastfeed their children, okay? Now, in terms of, this is something I think is important. CDC for the past 10 years or so has recommended that everybody, so everybody between the ages of 13 and 64, uh, get tested at least once in their lifetime for HIV infection. We, a lot of us think that this number should probably go out to 70 or so, but right now this is the current CDC recommendation. And I, I don't know if you uh, do this in your practice, you might not. It's really been tough for us to get this out into the general community. You can imagine how tough it is, say Ken, for you to see, uh, I don't know, a patient who's in for their physical exam, say Bob, who's 55 years old, for his physical exam, he's been married for 25 years, has two kids, and then you say, um, hey, Bob, I'm gonna do an HIV test on you, right? Uh, it, the verbiage has to be uh, correct in order for patients and physicians to accept this. You know, importantly, um, written consent in the United States is not required, and we've changed our strategy. We no longer have opt-in testing. It's now opt-out testing. If you don't know the difference, it would be the following. You can say, hey, Bob, um, do you want me to do an HIV test on you today? And that's opt-in test. Opt-out testing would be, hey, Bob, um, everyone uh, is supposed to get one HIV test in their lifetime, and I'm going to do that for you today. Is that okay? So that's opt-out testing. So in order to prove the, improve the rates of HIV testing in the United States, we no longer require written consent in any states. And uh, the strategy has been changed from opt-in testing to opt-out testing. So the other people, hard part about that is, is say, no, I'm sorry, I was going to say the other hard part about that is, you know, often people move around, their records, you don't have anything. You're talking about HIV one time in a lifetime. You, you know, you don't know, they don't remember. Sure. And so it's not only that, but I find occasionally insurance reimbursement is an issue as well. So you have to use the right code. People who are at more than average risk for HIV should get more frequent testing. So instead of once in a lifetime, that might be once a year. Many of our patients who are in for HIV prevention, we actually do HIV testing once every few months. And, and you probably know this, pregnant women have HIV testing done as part of their uh, prenatal care. Don't want to talk about the evolution of HIV diagnostic assays. Once again, probably a little complex for this talk. But what I do want to talk about is this slide here, which goes over the basic, three of the basic tests that we do uh, for HIV screening. And HIV, in, interpreting HIV test results is not easy. Um, that being said, the three ones that we do most are include the rapid test. So this is done in mobile testing units or clinics uh, that may not have that great funding. Uh, the rapid test was 
uh, tests the presence of HIV antibody, usually in the blood, but it can also be in um, an oral swab as well. The advantage of the rapid test is that it's quick. It, uh, the results come back anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes and it's inexpensive. The problem with rapid tests is that there's a number of false positives and pro probably a bigger problem are false negatives. Now remember this, where this depends on the presence of HIV antibody. And you've all probably heard of something called the window period. So the window period is the time between somebody being exposed to HIV and the immune system actually making HIV antibody. And that can be anywhere from three weeks to two months. So you can imagine somebody who comes in after a, a, an exposure two weeks ago, uh, this test is going to come back negative and that might be a false negative test. So the second one, the one that we do most frequently in our office is called the fourth generation HIV test. So this combines the HIV antibody, which is the same as the antibody here, but along with something called a P24 antigen. So this way we're testing something which is produced by our own immune systems and something that's produced by the virus. This tends to become positive about 10 to 14 days after exposure. Uh, the, the disadvantage of this test is most of the time it's a send out test. So the blood has to be sent to um, a Quest or LabCorp and it comes back in one or two days. So it's not an immediate result. It's a little bit more expensive than the rapid test, but it increases the sensitivity because this, once again, this becomes positive 10 to 14 days after exposure. And the last test that we do is something called an HIV RNA. So this is a nucleic acid test, which basically looks for the genetic material of the virus uh, in the sample. The problem with this, this test is that it takes anywhere from five to seven business days to get it back. And it's the most expensive. It usually costs a couple hundred bucks. So because of that, it's not great for screening. <clears throat> but the advantage of this test is that it becomes positive usually within seven days. So it's the most sensitive test we have. It's the one we use if somebody reports having an exposure uh, within the past you know, seven, 10 days or so, okay? Not gonna go over this. This is like one of the busiest slides I've ever seen. I can't believe somebody actually presents this, but okay. So let's talk a little bit about what we do if we have someone with HIV infection. There's two main things that we look at. And the first thing is called the viral load. So the viral load is a number of HIV particles uh, per milliliter of blood. The main goal that we have of therapy is to put somebody on medication and bas basically drive the viral load to undetectable levels. In most uh, docs offices, that is down to 20, less than 20 copies per milliliter of blood. It's really amazing actually, 20 copies, that's nothing, right? And the dynamic range of this test is between 20 copies and 10 million, really something. But that's anyway the, um, the goal of therapy, and that's what we measure the viral load. Once again, we want this viral load to be undetectable because that accomplishes two things. Number one, that allows the immune system to recover. And then number two, perhaps just as importantly, it makes it so that person cannot transmit HIV to his or her sexual partners. Okay. The second thing that we look at in monitor is the CD4 cell. It's otherwise known as T helper cell. So you have a lot of different types of white blood cells in your body. And one of these types is called lymphocytes. There's two different types of lymphocytes. One's called T cells and the other is called B cells. B cells make antibodies as well as other functions. And T cells basically run around the blood and other tissues and look for foreign invaders. And they kill those invaders or they kill those cells that are infected with those foreign invaders. There's two types of T cells. One's called a CD4 cell or T helper cell, and the other is called the CD8 cell. The CD4 cells express this receptor here called a CD4 receptor. And since the virus attaches to a vulnerable cell through this receptor, this is the basic cell line that's vulnerable to HIV infection. A normal CD4 cell count in people who have a healthy immune system usually about 500 to 1500 cells per millimeter of blood. You can imagine uh, as the number of CD4 cells starts to fall with advancing HIV infection, that puts that person uh, at higher risk for developing an opportunistic infection or opportunistic malignancy. I just wanted to also, I'm sorry, I forgot, I wanted to emphasize that 
uh, this last bullet point here that HIV deceives the CD4 cell into making copies of itself. We will see that on a couple of sl uh, slides later. So we talked about the fact that HIV targets the immune system, specifically those CD4 cells. And pretty interestingly, in an untreated person with HIV infection, up to 10 billion new viral particles can be produced each day. So really rapid uh, replication rate. And with years, obviously, the, with, with um, all this replication, uh, those CD4 cells are killed. And if that number of CD4 cells drops below 250, then that person is going to be at risk for co coccidiomycosis or coxy. Below 200, and these are all um, these are all ranges, basically. Uh, below 200, pneumocystis pneumonia is what we see frequently. Below 150, histoplasmosis. Below 100, toxoplasmosis. And below 50, mycobacterium avium complex, CMV, and cryptococcus. All of these, except for maybe coxy, are organisms that people with normal immune systems almost never get because the immune, your immune system keeps you from getting these, even though these are, that the fact that these or, organisms are ubiquitous. So this is what we, the natural course of HIV disease. This is what we used to see years ago before the introduction of highly active antiretroviral therapy. I really find this graph interesting. So the purple line is the viral load. The red line is a CD4 count. So at, when somebody gets infection, and so when somebody gets exposed to HIV, the viral load goes up very rapidly uh, within three, four weeks or so, the viral load can go to a million copies, 5 million, 10 million copies per milliliter of blood. And then the person may or may not get really sick at this time with acute HIV infection. And uh, the symptoms of that include a really bad sore throat, a really bad rash, and usually a fever to 104 degrees or so. The person is usually really sick with acute HIV infection. And as you can see, the, CD, the immune system really takes a hit here. The CD4 count really falls um, uh, uh, quite dramatically. And then the immune system starts to gain control of the virus. And the viral load falls down to a set point. So to some degree, the immune system can control the virus. And the CD4 cell count recovers. And this lasts, this sort of uh, set point between the viral load and the CD4 cell count lasts for years. So up to about six years or so. And at this point, uh, the virus is replicating. It's destroying CD4 cells, but the bone marrow is making new ones. And so they basically equilibrate. But the number of new CD4 cells that anybody's bone marrow can make is limited. And then eventually it starts to fail. And when that happens, the CD4 cell starts to decline rapidly. It obviously loses control of the virus and the viral load starts to increase dramatically. And when that happens, and when the CD4 cell count drops below 200, people are at risk for developing opportunistic infections and eventually die. Okay, but remember, there's this long asymptomatic period where the CD4 cell count and the viral load are sort of at set points and the person has no symptom. You can imagine that this person feels well, then they may be able to transmit HIV very easily. And that's pretty characteristic of um, organisms that transmit via a sexual route, that they have a long asymptomatic period. Okay. Adam, can I just make one comment there too? Is yeah, sure. We were always taught, uh, you know, that the, the acute retroviral syndrome, you know, obviously not everybody gets that, not everybody gets that 104, and it can look like just a regular old cold or something, you know, so it can, it's not as always so obvious that there's something serious or, or big going on. That's it. Uh, that's a really great point. I can't tell you how many people come into my office and they said, you know, doc, uh, six months ago, um, I went to my primary care doctor. I went to the ER with a sore throat and a viral, a sore throat and a fever, and they diagnosed me with influenza or with mononucleosis. And um, that's why, you know, I encourage providers that if they have somebody at risk with a, what looks like a viral syndrome, they should go ahead and think about acute HIV. And the problem at this point with um, acute HIV is that the, uh, the antibody is negative, right? Because this is at the time of seroconversion. So it may be positive, but there's a good chance it's going to be negative. So if you're thinking about this, you have to order an HIV RNA, okay?
Now, we don't want to talk too much about the CDC classification system. We don't really use this much anymore. We used it more when a lot of people had progressive disease. We don't see this progressive disease much anymore, so uh, this is not used much. They will just want to mention a few things about the HIV care continuum. This is basically more a goal for us. It's based on UN AIDS 90-90-90 criteria. Um, and what that means is that in a particular country, we want 90% of people who have HIV infection to be actually be diagnosed, 90% of them to actually be on medication, be in care, and 90% of them uh, to be suppressed. Because in terms of societal goals, the most important thing is to achieve and maintain viral suppression. But if we do that, there will be no transmission, right? And the care continuum is difficult because we're talking about engaging people in care and more importantly, retaining them in care. And a lot of our patient population have issues that put them at risk for HIV infection in the first place, making it very difficult for them to be retained in care. So I'm talking about injection drug use, homelessness, active psychiatric issues. Okay. You can also imagine that certain groups are not as good as being retained in care or achieving viral suppression as others. So this is the average in the United States in 2018. And uh, uh, the average in 2018 wasn't so great. We're doing pretty well in terms of getting people with an HIV infection diagnosed, not so good keeping them virally suppressed. You look at one of the issues is young people. Because if you look at the age range, uh, so the yellow dots here are people, the percentage of people that are virologically suppressed. And you look at 33, 13 to 24 and 25 to 34, less than 50% of people in this age range uh, are virologically suppressed. Whereas people who are older, 64. So this is where we really don't do a great job of pe keeping people in care. <clears throat> In terms of special populations or key populations, African-Americans uh, have a lower virologic suppression rate as well as women. This is done in District of Columbia, as well as MSM. Yet older people, not a problem, not nearly as much of a big deal. So older people seem to be better at, um, uh, at staying in care and achieving and maintaining virologic suppression. All right, now more scientific stuff. And this is stuff I kind of like, hopefully you're interested in it too. This is the schematic of, the, of, uh, of an HIV particle. An HIV is an RNA virus. Um, you may know that most organisms use DNA as a genetic material, HIV uses RNA. And there's a, a number of RNA viruses that have caused previous epidemics and pandemics. And those include not only HIV, but Ebola, um, uh, Zika, uh, influenza, and of course, of course SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus that caused the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is it about RNA viruses that make them so, so able to cause pandemics and epidemics? Well, there's probably two main qualities about them that do so. Number one is the rapidity of replication. We saw that in an untreated person with HIV infection, that 10 billion new viral particles are made per day. The second thing is probably because that viral replication is very error prone. And when you think about it, with various processes, usually having errors within that process is not a good thing. But in terms of viral replication, it really improves, it's really a great strategy, it really improves survival greatly. Because uh, if you make mutated virus, yes, most of the, that, those mutated species are incompetent. They're not gonna be able to replicate and they're gonna just, well, die is a wrong word. They're just going to kind of fall away. Um, but every once in a while, a mutated viral species will be formed that's going to be more fit, more able to replicate than the original virus. And the original virus is called wild type. So under certain selection pressure, say immune system pressure or in the presence of medication, um, the mutated virus may be more able to survive. And we saw that with SARS-CoV-2, that as we had vaccinations in our own uh, antibodies formed to kill that virus or the early medicines that we had against SARS-CoV-2, <clears throat> the virus just mutated away from them. And um, that's what HIV does as well. Now there's an error in here. The first bullet point says that HIV is a type of virus called a retrovirus because it's only genetic material is RNA. 
And that's actually not correct. <clears throat> All retroviruses are RNA viruses, but most RNA viruses are not retroviruses. A retrovirus is one whereby the uh, viral RNA is converted into DNA, and replication occurs when the proviral DNA is incorporated into the host cell genome. So that's what a retrovirus is. And most RNA viruses replicate without being incorporated into the host genome, okay? If you're interested, there are two types of HIV, HIV-1 and HIV-2. The United States, HIV-1 is predominant. In Africa, HIV-2 is predominant. And they do have different life cycles and uh, clinical features. Let's talk quickly. I like this. I hope you too, too. Let's talk quickly about the life cycle of HIV. So HIV, uh, the virus has this little structure on the outside called a GP120, glycoprotein 120, which fits nicely into this CD4 risk, um, receptor here expressed on this safety help receptor. And so that's how the virus attaches to a vulnerable cell. What's not shown here is that the virus also needs the presence of a co-receptor called CCR5 or chemo prime receptor 5. Uh, and then when that's, those two receptors are joined to the virus, infusion occurs into the uh, cell membrane and the uh, viral genetic material is expressed into the cellular cytoplasm. Viral, DNA, viral RNA expressed here, uh, shown here as in red, is converted into viral DNA uh, through an enzyme that the virus brings with it called reverse transcriptase. And then viral DNA is um, brought to the cell nucleus and incorporated into the cellular DNA through a enzyme that it brings with it called integrase. It is kind of fascinating because the integrase has to clip the correct ends of the cellular DNA, insert the viral DNA, and then repair those two ends. But somehow it's able to do that. Now, if this T helper cell is resting, then that proviral DNA just stays there, doesn't do anything. It's there forever until the cell dies. And that's called a latent virus. And the latent viral population is the reason that HIV cannot be cured, at least not right now, because this proviral DNA is not vulnerable to the medicines that we use or to our own immune systems. Now, if this virus, if, sorry, if this cell is active, then this proviral DNA gets transcribed into new R, viral RNA particles. These viral RNA par particles are long and non-functional. They have to be cleaved into functional units and viral protease accomplishes that. You may have heard of protease inhibitors. And the protease, this is where the protease inhibitors work. And then this um, viral material is then assembled. The virus buds off. It matures and makes a structure around the genetic material called the capsid, and then goes on and repeats the, life, the, the cycle again. Okay? So in terms of treatment now, the only goal of antiretroviral therapy right now is to suppress the viral load. That's it. Because if we suppress the viral load, everything else falls into place. The person's immune system uh, remains healthy. Their other organ systems remain healthy. They will actually live as long as someone who's HIV negative. And also importantly, as we mentioned, um, they will not be able to transmit them. So their class of, of antiretroviral drugs that we have are based on those uh, life cycle steps that we saw previously. Okay? And I'll show them in a minute. These are all the meds that we've had approved since 1985 to the present. You may have seen a couple of them that have been advertised recently on TV, including Dovato, Victardi, and Cabanuva. But really, of all these meds, we really only use about three, four, or five of them currently. Okay, And I find it interesting to figure out what, where they work. So if we block this GP120 um, structure here, then the virus can't attach to the cell. And we actually have a medicine that does that now. It's called Fostemsevir. We can block the CD4 receptor. There's a medicine that does that now. Uh, it's called Ibilizumab. And it's actually an antibody directed against the CD4 receptor. So it doesn't seem to interfere with function of the CD4 receptor because if it did, then you can imagine there would be a, a, a bad immune system dysfunction related to that. But it sterically changes the shape of the CD4 receptor enough that the virus can no longer bind. 
We talked a little bit about the present, how there has to be presence of a co-receptor called CCR5. And we have a medicine that blocks CCR5, it's called Mirabarol. We talked a little bit about converting viral RNA into DNA, and that's done by a viral enzyme called reverse transcriptase. If you remember AZT, the first medicine we had against, uh, that worked against the, uh, HIV, it works in this area. It is a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Uh, the viral DNA then goes into the cell and incorporate into the nucleus and then is incorporated into cellular DNA. And that's accomplished by a vir viral um, enzyme called integrase. And we can block integrase now. As a matter of fact, integrase inhibitors are now our mainstay of treatment. And the reason for that is because they're so potent and they're very, very well tolerated. So most highly active antiretroviral therapy regimens include one integrase inhibitor with two nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Most of the time they're included in one pill. So you've seen the advertisement for Victarvi and that's what Victarvi is. Um, if the cell is active, once again, it transcribes the proviral DNA into RNA, and these long viral RNA particles have to be cleaved into, um, into functional units. That's done by protease, and what protease inhibitors uh, were the first medicines that we had that were we to uh, achieve highly active antiretroviral therapy. And then the, the capsid is made, the structure is made around the uh, genetic material of the virus. I'll be honest, I'm not sure what the function though of the capsid is, but in any case, it's important now because we just had approval of a capsid inhibitor and it's called lenacapavir. It's interesting because it's given by injection and it's dosed once every six months. And we will probably have this available for HIV prevention late next year. And when it comes out, it's gonna be very popular, I think, because, you know, get one dose every six months, that's really attractive. So all these meds have been really potent, have really changed uh, the, um, have really changed the clinical aspect of HIV. And so now, as I mentioned, if someone is diagnosed relatively early with HIV and he or she takes antiretroviral medicine as they're supposed to and has a pretty healthy lifestyle, uh, the life expectancy of that person should be the same as their age match control. And you can see that here, that in 1995, when we first had highly active antiretroviral therapy, the death rate just went off a cliff here. And the number of new classifications of AIDS fell as well. So pretty impressive. Not going to talk about drug resistance. Uh, it is something that we have to deal with, and especially in patients who are non-compliant. And it's a problem. Um, as we have had more and more potent therapies uh, available, this has become less of a problem. It's much more of an issue back when we first had highly active antiretroviral therapy, and uh, the regimens weren't nearly as potent as they are now. So I'm going to skip over this. And um, let's just talk about prevention. Because obviously, a lot of time and effort now has been put into prevention because this is one of two arms of getting to zero. A lot of counties are getting to, uh, and organizations and areas have getting to zero campaigns. And the two arms to that are putting people at risk who are at risk for HIV infection to be on preventative medicines. And what we'll talk about is people who are HIV infected to be on medicine to be virologically suppressed. And we call that treatment as prevention. So PrEP and treatment as prevention are both the, are the two arms for getting to zero. So in terms of perinatal infection with HIV, that's been a pretty good success story in the United States, especially since uh, prenatal HIV testing has been um, uh, required. In, in 2019, in the United States, only 32 children have vertical acquisition of HIV, meaning perina perinatally infected. Um, you can see, however, that there's disparities in care. Uh, the purple line is African-American and their rate of um, H perinatal HIV infection is quite a bit higher than any other ethnic group in the United States. If you're interested in the numbers of uh, perinatal transmissions in each state, they're here. 
Don't know how much this means though, because the numbers are so small. And then we can talk in terms about prevention, we can talk about PrEP. And once again, the first medicine to prevent HIV infection was approved in 2012, it's called Truvada, uh, tenofovir disaproxyl fumarate and FTC in a um, fixed dose combination. This is now available generic and it's cheap. Our uh, pharmacy sells it for $35 for a month supply. Its cousin it has a brand name called Descovi. Uh, it's made by Gilead and it's very similar. It's, it uses a different tenofovir prodrug. So instead of TDF, it uses TAF combined with the same FTZ, FTC um, in a fixed dose combination. Both of these are taken daily. So they're daily oral prep. And then we have a new medicine that uh, came available about a year and a half ago. It's pretty interesting. It's an integrase inhibitor called cabotegravir and it comes in an injection and it's given once every two months. And its popularity is increasing, especially in young people who aren't used to taking a pill every day and find it difficult to do so. This can be a, a, a good option for them. And we give Apertude uh, regularly in our practice. Okay, um, same day start for PrEP is one thing that many uh, organizations are now doing. We have a walk-in same day start PrEP clinic. So if somebody comes in for S HIV and STD screening and we ask them if they think that they're a candidate for PrEP and if they say yes, then we start them that day on a preventative medicine, usually with either Truvada or Descovy uh, because Apertude takes benefits investigation investigation in order to, uh, uh, to administer. So interestingly, in terms of PrEP, there's, another, there's of course big issues with disparities of care with this as well. So uh, before, oh, sorry, before I go into that, who do we prescribe PrEP for? So obviously people with traditional risk factors for HIV infection. So that would be MSM with multiple partners, heterosexual men and women with multiple partners, especially if they're active, uh, in a high prevalence area or a high prevalence network, somebody who's using injection drugs and shares needles, somebody who's sexually active with somebody of, uh, who is known to be HIV positive or has unknown HIV status, but basically anybody who asks for it. So the standards in the community are that if someone comes in and asks for PrEP, even if they don't have any obvious risk factors, we prescribe it for them because we feel that that person may not be comfortable um, be, being honest about their risk factors with you. So basically anybody who comes in who wants to be on PrEP will be on PrEP. Now I mentioned the um, issues with disparities of care. In the United States, only 25% of people currently who are at risk for HIV infection have been prescribed a medicine for PrEP. And if you're white, and you need to be on PrEP, there's a 66% chance that you've been prescribed HIV prevention medicine. Yet, if you're Latino, it's only 16%. And if you're African-American, it's only 9%. And if you remember uh, the information I showed you on the 20, 20 CDC data um, about new infections, 69% of new infections of HIV in the United States were among these two uh, groups. And yet they're by far less likely to receive HIV prevention medicine than Caucasian. Adam, have you, what, do you know much about, you know, this is being prescribed, what about their compliance as well? One, one of my experiences, at least in my old practice, when we provide PrEP, was always, it was the people who were most worried about it. They were super vigilant, always used protection, often were monogamous anyways, but still worried about it, took their medications, right? They, they were very vigilant, uh, you know, intelligent, educated people who would come in and want to get the PrEP. It's the, you know, it was always seemed to be the other people who were not, uh, who are more uh, at risk and more, you know, uh, uh, cavalier about it that are also the ones that are less likely. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right that people who don't really need it are the ones that come to your office all the time and get the prescriptions filled even a day early, right? Well, that's a problem. Retaining people in care with HIV infection is really tough. Retaining the people in care who are HIV negative on PrEP is even more difficult because a lot, a lot of times we're talking about young people who don't have experience with the medical uh, system, who may be working and can't take time off to come see you or me every three months. 
and have no experience taking a pill every day. Now all of a sudden we're saying you got to take a pill every day. That's really tough for some people. And for something um, they don't have. But it's again, especially when we're telling them to take it for something they don't even have yet. Right. It's not there. Right. So pill fatigue is a real problem uh, with with uh, prep. And all I can say is, you know, we have people who come in, they're really excited about it. They come see us uh, for the first three months, six months, nine months. And then hey, you're right, that compliance that part tends to fall off a cliff. So what we try to do is we uh, have um, retention coordinators that then try to call or text or email and try to get that person back in the gym. But it's not easy, right? Um, then we talk a little bit about treatment as prevention. So um, once again, this represents people who are, are already infected, who have HIV, we try to retain them in care and get them to take their medicine um, every day. And if we can drive their viral load to undetectable levels and maintain that, then we call it un U equals U. Undetectable equals untransmissible. And we try to get this out into the community and we hope it does a couple of things. Number one, we hope it reduces stigma in a person who's HIV positive because now we let him or her know that they have an infectious disease that can't be transmitted. Number two, we hope that improves retention and care and improves compliance with medicine because if he or she knows that they will not be able to transmit it to others, then that gets them to, to come see us as they're supposed to and take their medicine as they're supposed to. You can see that there's, we talked a little bit about the UN AIDS goals of 90, 90, 90, and fast track cities, which are cities that agree to these goals and spend more time, effort, and money on attaining them, have uh, a new goal by 2030 to have 95, 95, 95, meaning 95% of people in their uh, city are diagnosed, 95% of those people are on medicine, and 95% of those people are suppressed. Okay. And that's basically it. So this is the, the, the drug company summary. I think the biggest summary to take away from this is a couple of things. Uh, number one, if there's somebody that you know with HIV infection, if that person takes their medicines every day, exercises regularly, does not smoke, um, and stays away from recreational drugs and excessive alcohol, that person should live as long as someone who's HIV negative. The second thing to take away is that there are two arms to reduce HIV transmissions in the United States and globally, and that would be HIV prevention and uh, treatment as prevention. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Ken, I don't know if you want me to, well, it's been almost an hour, but I don't know if you want me to mention anything about cure strategy. About what? Your about cure, yeah, I mean, great. Well, the cure prevention. I mean, you know, the one thing I think that everybody I, I always hear about is, you know, everyone I know everyone's working on vaccines, and you know, I guess they always say we're we're five years. The last twenty years have been five years away from a vaccine. Um, is, have, you, have you heard? Is there any breakthroughs? Still, still no, no. No, the problem is what I mentioned before is the rapidity of mutated virus um, um, uh, developing. In HIV. So if we develop a vaccine that is focused on an epitope of, um, of the virus, meaning a structure in the virus, all, of, all it does is have to have a mutation that changes that structure a little bit and it mutates away from, um, from the antibody. Therefore, those vaccines trials have not worked well. What is sort of on the horizon is something called BNABs. I don't know if you've heard of that, but broadly neutralizing antibodies. So just like HIV medicine, where we have to give three meds to defeat the possibility of a mutated virus from developing, if we can have three different antibodies at the same time, maybe we can prevent the virus from mutating away from the vaccine results, right? So. Broadly neutralizing antibody means that there's multiple antibodies directed against different anti um, uh, epitopes on the virus. <clears throat> and there's actually some people who make broadly neutralizing antibodies. And we think that those people become what we call elite controllers. So 
Once again, I think this is fascinating, but people who developed HIV infection, who have a viral load that's either undetectable or very low off of medicine, and they don't usually have disease progression. So what is it about their immune system that allows them to control virus, whereas many, most other people cannot do that? And one, one possible explanation is that those people make broadly neutralizing antibody that keeps the virus in check. So now there are multiple broadly neutralizing antibodies that are in clinical trials right now. And they're given by infusion and we can alter that antibody so it becomes long acting. So instead of being metabolized right away, it can stick around for three to six months. And therefore, this is part of our long acting regimen uh, in development and possibly pure as well. You can imagine if you develop an effective broadly neutralizing antibody that sticks around for a really long time or even yet, and that's called passive immunization, even yet develop a vaccine that teaches the immune system uh, effectively to make these broadly neutralizing antibodies that will come up with a cure. So I think that's where most of this has kind of migrated to, um, is broadly neutralizing antibodies seem to be the future. There is one problem with broadly neutralizing antibodies, which is kind of interesting. Broadly neutralizing antibodies, the, the, your own immune system makes antibodies against them. And that, that if that happens, then those broadly neutralizing antibodies obviously become ineffective. So there's a way that has to be, and I don't, I'm not a, obviously a virologist or an immunologist, I don't know how, but somehow they can make the BVAB so it's less likely to cause an immune response. Anyway, so that's fun stuff. I think, I think, it's, I think it's very fascinating too. I, I think it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, um, go ahead. I was gonna say, I just, I, I, I had uh, just a couple more questions for you. Yeah, but yeah, sure. you questions, you, you know, feel free to put them in the chat um, and we can uh, try to get to them as we can. Uh, but, um, I, I, one of my questions was, I know you, we always use the, the um, three medications, but why is it that you would use two protease inhibitors and an integrase inhibitor instead of from three different classes? Why would you overlap? Them? A couple a couple of things. Um, number one, uh, we no longer have to use three medicines. Um, the new regimens that you saw up there, many of them are only two medicines. So I don't know if you've seen Dovato advertised or Cabanuva advertised. But those are only two, two regimens instead of three. Many, the, the paradigm was for many years that three medicines need to be done to prevent the virus from developing resistance. But as the individual medicines have become more and more and more potent, then only two seem to be necessary now. We can't get away right now with monotherapy. That's been tried and failed each time. But it looks like many people can get away with two different medicines as long as they are really potent. So Devado and Cabanuva. Cabanuva is the injectable medicine that's given every two months. So it's two medicines given by injection every two months. In terms of what you said, um, I, I, there, are, there are no regimens that have two protease inhibitors uh, in them. In the old days, when there was a lot of resistance, we tried that, it didn't work. Um, so. All of them are integrase inhibitors with a, 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 a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. All right, and anyway. then the other thing is that the, um, uh, you said that um, uh, uh, women who've just given birth or HIV positive shouldn't are recommended not to breastfeed their kids, but if they're compliant and they're taking their medication and they are, have uh, the zero viral load, wouldn't it be safe for them to breastfeed them? Yeah, you would think so. The CBC, that's a really controversial uh, topic right now, and it's probably going to be revised. I imagine within the next year, the CDC will change their recommendations and allow women who have an undetectable viral load uh, to, to breastfeed. But don't forget, it's not only the virus that you have to worry about, but also the medicine that they're taking getting into the breast milk. And a lot of the, so far, everything seems to be safe for the baby, but we're not sure uh, completely. And there was this big scare a few years ago about dolutegravir, a medicine, an integrase inhibitor that we use a lot, um, causing neural tube defects. There was a signal that came out of, um, um, what was it? 
forget the name of the, it's a southern, uh, sub-Saharan African country, I forget which one, where neural tube defects seem to be higher in women who are taking Dolly Tegrity. That seemed to be, uh, and so we, they stopped, we stopped using dolutegravir in pregnant women, unfortunately, because it was turned out to be a, a that was fa a false signal. So now we're back to using dolutegravir uh, in, in women who are pregnant. Um, but we think because of the advantages that are obtained by breastfeeding your kid, that this is gonna change within the next year, but we're not sure. It seems to make sense. That's a yeah, yeah. Right. Anything um, else? Doesn't look like anybody, if anybody has any other questions, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Doesn't look like anybody has any other questions. Um, yeah, but, well, uh, thank you. yeah, this was, this was, this was much better than I expected. It to be. Really? <laughs> 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 All right. I'm, I'm sure your mother is going to be very proud. So you think she's still on? If she's still on. She's still no, registered. I don't know if they're paying attention, but they're still. Yeah, they probably wouldn't know how to chat anyway. So. They're still logged in. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, well, right. thank you. That was great. That was yeah, really yeah, good. I thought. Right. Thanks very much. And uh, you know, if if anybody has any questions that come up or comments, or you have a friend or a relative that you're worried about, you can obtain my um, um, my information. From Ken. Right. Yeah. And anybody, if they want, yeah, you can get it through me. You can always contact our our office, and I can. Yeah. I know where to find him. So, <laughs> thanks everybody again. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. All right. okay. Great. Have a great night. Good night.